So today we are going to talk about uh, Kenya's place internationally you know our defense strategy our foreign relations and all and we are joined by a member of parliament for Bill Good constituency he is also the chairman of the National Assembly's Defense Intelligence and Foreign Relations Committee the honorable Nelson Koech good morning good morning uh, karibu sana to Kenya's biggest conversation thank you, thank you very much good to have you here brother thank you that is the hot seat as you i'm sure you know of uh, the situation room let's see how it is yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let's see <laughs> now you're the chair of the national assembly's defense intelligence and foreign relations committee it's a departmental committee yeah what's the mandate of that committee so basically our mandate is to oversight oversight the, uh, the defense uh, Kenya national defense which is the ministry of defense the intelligence and uh, the ministry of foreign affairs um but we also look at their budget uh, appropriate appropriation of budget and um uh, look how they spend their their budget as well so our mandate is just majorly oversighting all the, uh, these authorities so it's oversighting those three yep the ministry of defense yes the national security intelligence service and the uh, and the ministry of foreign, foreign affairs. affairs now with diaspora affairs now with diaspora as well yep. ministry of foreign and diaspora, and diaspora affairs. affairs yeah now the first two especially when it comes to budget we always hear that those are closed budgets mm -hmm. nobody gets an eye into them yeah do you of course the constitution has allowed everyone to look at the budget the yeah. auditor general's report is published mm -hmm every year and uh, we scrutinize item by item you see the people many people do not understand uh, these two budgets particularly that one of the uh, Kenya defense forces because it's a huge budget and people ask like right now what we've uh, we've proposed for our bps is 148 billion kenya shillings but if you look at it that way then it's it's mind boggling but if you go now into the details mm -hmm. you realize there isn't much really that is left because we have a huge uh, military force which is you know protection of the sovereignty of the country is very necessary and personnel and emoluments usually is what constitutes this 148 billion what's the percentage that goes into salaries about 65% into recurrent into recurrent yeah and this is salaries plus yeah and i'll tell you it's extremely expensive running the ministry of defense what? um recently i was with the now the cdf uh, two three weeks ago in mombasa mm. one of the ships fueling one ship fighter one of those fighter ships that is used to transport cargo military cargo uh, the fighting tanks and all this to fuel it is 38 million one trip one, one trip okay so nice. Just pause. <laughs> what sort of fuel does it use? It uses uh, diesel. Uh, okay. So it's one ship is equal to very many petrol stations. So many. What? It's actually been packed for a few months now. You see, we are, we are, the, the military is trying to to bring back our officers uh, from the Somalia. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So some of our ammunition uh, in Somalia I shouldn't be saying this mm. yeah, but yeah so the process of bringing it back is starting now okay. and it's it's going to be very expensive so that's one item number two, even purchase of an aircraft Fokker for instance mm. costs in excess of 3. Point something billion mm. Yeah, I mean, the word you use is mind-boggling, some of these numbers that we're hearing already, <coughs> excuse me, but even from an oversight perspective, usually the money that goes into or the budget that is set aside for defense, for intelligence, for MOFA, is rarely questioned in terms of why is it so much? Uh, because there is an underlying understanding mm -hmm. that it's the defense of a nation, yeah. its sovereignty that is being protected, the, its foreign affairs and foreign relations with other countries and securing of boundaries and things like that. So you don't really question if this is what they say the budget is, <clears throat> excuse me, then that's what the budget is. Is that a right stance to take or even that must be questioned when it comes to and is that some of the stuff that this particular committee then takes into consideration well, I don't think that uh, many people what it's not about the budget mm. what is questioned in the in the in the military mm. what people question is how procurement is done mm -hmm. that is actually where there is a lot of secrecy if you mm -hmm. may call 
because most of the items that are being purchased, there's a line they use that these are security items. And many times, they want to go for single sourcing okay. or strict uh, uh, tendering where not many players are involved. That is now where there's a lot of questions uh, many times. Mm. Um, that is now where we've come in to scrutinize. If you've noticed in the recent past, I've been able to accompany um, the various delegations. I've sent my committee to various delegations, especially where they are purchasing. If they are purchasing, for instance, armored personnel carriers, we want to know where they are buying them from. We want to know the cost mm -hmm. from production and what other countries within the region are buying for, what taxes mm -hmm. are involved, so that we now have a bigger, broader picture of how much one item is supposed to cost, for instance. Because a layman, a member of parliament, like me, I have no background or training in, in, in military. Mm -hmm. So it is very difficult for me, first of all, to comprehend those figures. But now when it is broken down and I'm told, uh, you know, we are building a production line in Eldoret, for instance, yeah. um, I want to know how much does it cost to do a production line in Russia. I want to know what kind of production line they, 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 they are building. With technology and with advanced uh, 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 IT, it is so easy mm. nowadays to find out the cost of any item, even mm. those that are classified as security items. So is it possible to say then that previously or historically, then there might have be qu been quite a lot of wastage or pillage on this front because these kind of questions have not been asked? Even now, not, uh, even now there's a lot of wastage. Mm. We have uh, uh, fighter jets that were brought in from Jordan. Years ago, when uh, General Karangi was 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 the CDF, mm. they they're, they're now they can't have never taken off from Nyanyuki. Why? In fact, they are cannibalizing those fighter jets to prepare the other ones because it was just a bad deal. We were sold. Um, Let me ask a question: Were they new? They were not new. They were used. Ah, yeah. and and our our people knew that these are second hand. Yes. It has come in as an audit query in the National Assembly. It was questioned by last uh, mm. parliament, successive parliaments, the last two uh, parliaments. So when those questions are asked, and they even tell you, actually, we can't use these things, we are now cannibalizing them, they are spare parts for our existing machinery, what then do you do as parliament? As parliament, you make recommendations, sometimes very uh, serious recommendations against uh, officers. Um, now it's up to the benevolence of the government of the day mm. to see it best if they want uh, to take uh, charge against those who are involved. To the best of your knowledge, is there, has there been any action taken against any military officer over procurement matters or DOD officer? You see, at that level, which I sometimes also kind of understand, you know, you're dealing with a general. Yeah. Because those things are not done by junior officers. And you're dealing with the level of a general. Many times, uh, it's every government will want to be safe with agenda, and that is why I think there hasn't been any, 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 any indictment of any senior officer from the military. Slap the, on the wrist. The, yeah, actually, they are, they are, they are, if you if you've noticed, when a, when a general retires, they are given a place, a soft place to land. Yeah. So that they continue there being. So, um, it's it's just being. You don't want to be in the bad books. I agree. Yeah. Of a general. <laughs> yeah. That yeah, is defense. Uh, yeah. NSIS. You see, in defense now, you've, you can explain. There is personnel. There is hardware. NIS. When they have this huge budget of theirs, what's it for? And NIS how are you able to then audit it? NIS is, uh, is quite disturbing. In mm. fact, the last regime misused the National Intelligence Service from its core mandate of uh, collecting information and advising the president on intelligence information mm. to being a procuring entity for government. It actually was used um, if, like you see, the, the, uh, there's, a thicker, there's a plant in Thika for manufacturing of small arms, mm. uh, guns, and some machine in Druiru. Yes. It, it, was not, it is not in the role of NIS to do that. You know, so uh, um, um, identifying uh, land for construction, I don't know of, of what, not totally outside the mandate of NIS. But it was easy for mm. the government of the day to do serious tender uh, processes using NIS and classifying them as this is extremely sensitive item. You've seen the investigation that is going on in Parliament currently on the acquisition, uh, almost acquisition of Telcom Kenya which was done by uh, Helios. And you notice that National Intelligence Service gave an advice 
against what will have been an advice from the Ministry of Information and Communication. So it was it was used, uh, disguised as some of the security uh, projects that are being done by the government, but has been abused. We interrogate every item in the National Intelligence Service. We visited the National Intelligence Service headquarters. We want to know what of, what is the role of every officer and what is purchased and for how. But sometimes it's very difficult because they tell you, we went, uh, we had some information from Latif that there were terrorists that were hiding somewhere <laughs> in Mombasa Road <laughs> and we had to pay him for the information. Mm. So how do you account for that? Mm. It's very difficult. Because it's a confidential information. It is, yeah. You can't really tell yeah. you who that was. We summoned them in Parliament many times and they say, you know, by the way, as we are talking yesterday in Parliament, there was supposed to have been an attack but because of the information that we have. First of all, you are scared as a member of parliament. <laughs> You're not going to question it. <laughs> <laughs> there, was, there was going to be an attack. Whether it is true or not, you see, they, they, they get away with it. There's something I'd like to ask you, Mashimiwa. <coughs> I am thinking not just of this matter that you have referred to regarding NIS being involved in matters procurement. My mind has gone further back. Mm -hmm into some scandals that have involved our armed forces. Mm -hmm. There was an, a huge one with the Navy. Mm -hmm. As we, is the case with such things, it went this way and that way, and then it went that way. And uh, it's a story that has never really been concluded. Mm -hmm. But in your thinking, even as you look at this a situation such as the one where NIS were brought in for procurement purposes, could there be logic behind it not the legality. Logic. Logic. Sometimes it's logic, especially when it involves national interest, especially geo. They, they're doing a lot of exp exploration to check on which part of the country we could have some strategic minerals. That makes sense without necessarily having to say some has logic, some is being abused. So I'm not saying that it's entirely uh, abused. Many times it's for the good of the country. Mm -hmm. Some of that information is very necessary. But like I was saying, it is not in their place to do procurement. I still insist that if any entity will want to do procurement, there's nothing like security uh, procurement that is being done. I'm going to take you a little back into history. When I was around about your age, uh, there was... <laughs> 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 and that's history. <laughs> yes. Well, that's history a long time ago. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> when we then had special branch. Yeah. Okay. Now, very little was known of special branch. Uh -huh. There was a gentleman called Kanyotu. There were people you heard of. You were fortunate to meet one such person. But what I heard, I never verified it, but I heard that for that service to function well, very many of its officers actually functioned as civilians. Mm -hmm. When I was a student at the University of Nairobi, I heard similar stories, and some of those stories were confirmed. Because there were some people who just how, some never, knew, never seemed to graduate. They were never graduating. <laughs> and, and if they graduated, they'd come back as master's students. I mean, the stories went on. Now, the logic, again, the word logic, was so that how then do you gather information how do you collect data if you're not involved in the everyday lives of the citizenry which therefore meant that every aspect of our lives according to that narrative that i heard they were special branch people now mm -hmm. nis is special branch yeah. so it therefore means that even in the hallowed house where you serve yeah if i'm to go with that logic there are people who are nis i would then extend to say even here where we work <laughs> there are people who are journalists but they may be nis how are you pointing at me, Bon? NIS... Uh, I went this way. <laughs> NIS Wanamuga, uh, uh, how it operates globally. Not even forget about Kenya. Forget about the special branch. It is still what it is now. NIS is not these people with uniform and will always report in Dwaraka. No. NIS is any officer. Today, for instance, when you go to the hotels, um, most of those waiters there... Uh, intelligence officers. Yeah, it's see. not intelligence in that sense. People are given a stipend mm. to news around and hear what people are saying for a fee. So you probably sit in, if this were a hotel, you'll have about four or five who are being retained by the national intelligence to give information on particular individuals of interest. So if you are planning, for instance, Mandamano, 
we will be able to know where you sat today and <laughs> with who and at what time it still happens in kenya that is why i'm saying mm. payment of such is not what you can account for you can't really so it becomes very thing. difficult for us to to account for such but what the nis now does is they call it operations mm. so we look at it in parliament as, as a operation cost and and we see how it's been broken down so we we have details which i do not want to break them here but we are aware okay. so be very careful even here mm. relative could just be an intelligent <laughs> 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 so then there's Moffa, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Yes. So uh, for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, what exactly do you, does this committee then look at when it comes to the ministry? Well, I'm looking at, uh, we're looking at so, so much, especially now. I'm, I'm so lucky that in my committee, we have uh, nine members of parliament who are in this committee in a previous uh, parliament. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you, uh, our embassies, Ministry of Foreign Affairs actually is a hat of this country where they are represent where we are represented in our embassies abroad in our missions abroad that is the image of our country and we make sure that they are adequately resourced at the uh, dying days of the last regime up to last month when i raised this matter before uh, when uh, uh, alfred Matua appeared before my committee most of our touches abroad had not been paid it took me to travel to Belgium and Germany to realize that they have not been paid six months what? before. What? Six months, some of our officers had not received, our attaches had not received payment. What does that mean? What are we talking about? Like your monthly salary? Monthly or? salary. So the last administration totally messed up with our foreign mission. Number two, we are going to shortly recommend uh, to the head of state that appointees from Ministry of Foreign Affairs, especially those who are going to be ambassadors, it is safe to have them, people who have grown from the diplomatic circle Career and political rejects ah. being rewarded to go to embassies. Mm. It is safe that way. Most of our embassies are, not, are almost dysfunctional because number one, they are old. Number two, some of them we've lapsed in payment. You know, like... Did we not have an embassy that was... Lapsed in down? payment in terms of rent arrears. Rent. Rent arrears. Rent arrears. There are, there are countries that have actually written very bad uh, reviews about Kenya for lapsing in payments of their rent and their dues. So my committee, when we collect all the information, when we visit missions, when we visit embassies, we are able to see exactly what happens with our embassies. Now, that is our oversight role. We come back and make recommendations. And when we are doing budget, we make sure that we deliberately resource the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to do its work. Now we have diaspora affairs. Mm. There's so much that is being remitted to this country from the people of the diaspora. So if we are not careful to have a robust um, mission abroad, we run the risk of mismanaging our but affairs. But if I'm to talk globally, is it not the trend globally when a new government comes in that one of the things they do, they will look for, not the majority, the majority of diplomats are professionals, but they will look for appointees who are politically appointed specifically because they serve the interest of those who are in power. This happens the world over. Are you saying that we in Kenya have a preponderance? We have very many people in our foreign missions who do not have diplomatic backgrounds. No, all I'm saying is that we, we want to enhance uh, mm. from where we're coming from to where we are going. It mm. is, like I was saying, it is a, not a good place to have, not necessarily politicians. Of course, there are politicians also who are from the diplomatic background. Yeah. You can easily, you can always post them. Mm. But there are people who totally do not understand what what diplomacy means you, you don't want to have such a person as a face of the country yeah. abroad mm -hmm. it is safer to have someone who has some a bit of knowledge and exposure and training on 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 on, on matters diplomacy mm -hmm. i was excited uh, the other day when i went with the president to uh, germany and met a brilliant ambassador, ambassador Molo, very exceptional person you know people who are who understand diplomacy people who serve in diplomacy then there are other embassies that i don't want to say that i visited recently that, that you know you meet an ambassador and you wonder come on where, where did i <laughs> am i in the where, where wrong this yeah <laughs> am i in the wrong place because you see there's nothing lately that has been done by any ambassador to attract the attention of this country and that is why many people don't even understand why we continue paying why do we expand our embassies for what yet there's nothing new that these ones that have been posted have done mm. we have to have a team that is significant that understand what we need for this country and to put our space in the global 
Uh, I want to belabor a little point here, if I may. Yeah? You did mention that the previous government made a bit of a boo-boo with our foreign missions. Is it possible for you to just mention if, if the details can't be spoken of in public, you don't have to, but what did they do that brought about this mess? First of all, you know, when you do postings, like I said, based on friendship and tribe to represent <laughs> you at missions, it is unfortunate. Mm. You know, it, it, it's supposed to be uh, people who understand what mm. they want to do for the country. Mm. So I think Amazada, uh, uh, what was his name, Ma 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 Masharia, did a lot of uh, uh, mess in our postings. We have strategic uh, missions, especially the UK because we trade a lot with them. We have, you know, Europe. Okay. We have, in Africa, we have Democratic Republic of Congo, Uganda, Tanzania. We have South Africa. So those missions, for me, you need people who are extremely strategic and people who understand what they want to do. Big Ted, for instance, is doing so, so well in Los Angeles, marketing our country, mm. because he's trying to tap talent in term, from music, from art, mm. so that we can have musicians and tap you know, what, what we don't have in the country. He's so, that sort of a person. He works well in Los Angeles. But you can put, for instance, Big Ted in the UK. <laughs> because it's... So I hope there are no artists in the UK. No, 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 no. <laughs> I, think, I get the point. <laughs> His point is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I get the point. On the issue, before we take a break, uh, because we're going to break shortly, on the issue of the staff not receiving a salary for six months, the people who work in our embassies abroad, are they employees of the Public Service Commission? Yes, what happened is this. It was a, there was a miscommunication. I don't want to entirely blame the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. There was a miscommunication. So most of our attaches um, who were traditionally paid from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs were moved to be paid from the Ministry of um, Immigration. Why? I do not know why Majeria did that. So our commercial attache, you know, defense attache, and all those attaches who are abroad had that problem. So between that space of trying to actualize the movement from this other bit of Ministry of Foreign Affairs, because they believe that Ministry of uh, Immigration are the ones who collect the dues for abroad for mm -hmm. passport renewals and all those things. It's that money that is then used to make uh, payments. Mm. So it was, I think they thought the government in its wisdom decided that since it's immigration that does that, it can as well just pay our officers abroad. Mm -hmm. When I went to Germany, and remember this was a presidential visit, yeah. quietly one of the attaches told me, I have not been paid for six months. We summoned Alfred Mutua who appeared before our committee, mm. and he said, yes, truly, we understand that the officers who have not been paid for six months, I said, then you need to do it now, because you can imagine someone who is living abroad and still calling Kenya to request for money. It's, it's not fair. Mm. We also have insurance, you know, they need insurance because now when you're not paid, it means that your insurance has lapsed. So you, in, in an event of a medical emergency, there's a problem. There is a case that I'm pursuing of one of our officers, uh, immigration officer, um, Minister of Foreign Affairs officer, based in the UK, who allegedly committed murder because of stress. That is something also that I need to, we as a committee, we need to investigate and find out what happened. Why did he jump over a building? And from what I get from the officers in Ministry of Foreign Affairs, quietly also, is that it was because of stress. I suicide. want to understand. It was suicide. So I want to understand why that happened. So we shall be summoning also the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to explain to us what exactly happened. Mm -hmm. If this, all these things have been contributed by our inefficiency, uh, in Kenya mm -hmm. from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, then of course we will make recommendations. So Kenya's defense forces are currently involved in an operation to flash out or to neutralize or whatever the word is being used, bandits in parts of the country. They were deployed in, uh, was it February or March? Okay. Um, Parliament was not uh, consulted before the gazettement of the deployment of the of the defense forces happened. Did you have a problem with this? 
Yeah, initially we, we had a problem with it because uh, the explanation at that time that we, we saw, you know, sometimes it's very good to, to stick to the Constitution. The Constitution, Section 241, that uh, uh, outlines exactly what it should be done in deployment of our officers within or uh, outside. We felt at that point that we had not been largely involved as, as, as Parliament, and we, when the Minister, we summoned the Minister, not just the Minister of uh, Defence, but the Minister of Defence and the Minister of Interior, because the letter that we received from Parliament was that the police was going to take the lead, but uh, Kenya Defence Forces were just going to enhance the operation of the police. So we needed to understand exactly... So who was going to have operational command, the uh, police or the army? The police do have the operational command even now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. So when we summoned uh, CS Dwale, he explained to us that yes, uh, they had requested because sometimes they needed technology that is not necessarily available in our Kenya police, especially using uh, the use of drones, the use of uh, aircrafts uh, with night vision to see where these bandits are fleeing to at night was only domiciled in our Kenya Defence Forces and they wanted that to, to happen. Number two, Kenya Defence Forces is also known that after this operation, it's not just about doing an operation and leaving. They want to rebuild the classrooms, they want to drill boreholes, they want to make roads. And uh, Kenya Defence Forces as a company that does that, uh, it's called Lindsay uh, Construction Company, which is uh, subservient of Kenya Defence Forces. So those explanations were given to us, and we as parliament were satisfied with that explanation that the command was going to be the Kenya police, and the Kenya Defence Forces were only going to complement the Kenya police. Mm. However, like you said, you stick to the constitution. Yeah. Is it the spirit and letter of the drafters of the constitution that um, such back doors could be left open? That a government of the day can actually deploy the military and say the military are working under the police in a security operation. It is allowed uh, sometimes when there is a threat, especially internal threat. I mean, we use it many times when there are terrorists. We've used it in Westgate before. Mm -hmm. And uh, because this thing was mutating to threaten the security of this country, it, it necessitates then that defense comes in, that their the sov the sovereign role is to protect mm -hmm. the integrity of the country within and outside the country. Mm. That much I understand, yeah. and it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. However, I'm asking from the drafters of the constitution, some of them sit in that parliament now, at the end you can ask him, was it in their thinking that it would be possible to just wake up and deploy the military within the borders of the country without having parliament having no, a say? Absolutely no. The oh. Constitution does not allow that. The okay. Constitution spells out clear that, first mm. of all, you seek the approval. Mm. Uh, approval from Parliament before you can so that Basically, it's the people of Kenya yes. must be aware yes. that the military is operating yes. in the country. Unfortunately, this mm. uh, happened when we were on recess. Mm. So I'm sure, and looking at uh, what was going on at that time, yeah, they decided to deploy and come and uh, seek concurrence from parliament at that time. And number two, mm. it is because it was not the Kenya Defence Forces that was being deployed. Mm. It was just backing up the Kenya Police Forces. So it was within the law for Kenya Police Forces to head the operation and have a neater Kenya Defence Forces. Mm -hmm. But they were still on <laughs> ground, were they not? <laughs> okay, so they were still, but that notwithstanding, whether they were in a support role, as you say, they were still on ground. Right? They were, yeah. And the term that we're going to use to having them removed from their base to this position is deployment. Yes. That's what it is. Yes. Right? Yeah. So we're still saying that in that regard, it was still necessary to seek the approval of parliament. Yes. The question is, though, with the drafters of parliament, an emergency by definition does not give you time to prepare. Mm -hmm. Would this ever have taken, been taken into consideration that there could come a time whereby parliament could be in recess other things could happen an act of god could have occurred and there was no time to seek the approval of parliament and then special circumstances would then be arrived at when this would happen so even with this explanation like uh, those are the questions the questions you're asking me are the hard questions that we asked the minister but even with this explain uh, with this uh, deployment there were a lot of questions that still came in nonetheless um, with the explanation, we took it, 
uh, that you know we were not leading this operation it's the police who are leading the operation and we asked them that now we needed to regularize from parliament so that even that deployment is within the constitution and and the, the spirit of the constitution mm. it was brought into parliament and as a house we resolved mm. and proceeded to pass it in fact many people uh, during that session uh, when i uh, when it was tabled by the leader of majority I had even requested that Kenya Defence Forces be deployed and the police be recalled. Let me tell you what happens in the north that many people might not understand. Mm. There seems to be some bit of resistance to the police. They believe that the military, even during roadblocks, do not ask for, for bribes and bribes. Mm -hmm. So they prefer to have the military than the police. Mm. Uh, yeah, so, so the high, there's higher trust for the military. For the military. <coughs> okay. And uh, members of parliament from within the North Rift even requested that, you know, now let's do it proper and deploy them so that they just guard the area and uh, until now it, there's relative stability, mm. which, I mean, you've seen it is happening. So we, we understand uh, the pain that you guys have in asking those questions, the same questions that I asked. But be as it may, this is our country. We want peace. Mm -hmm. And uh, whichever way we can achieve that peace, without necessarily being sticking so hard to the Constitution, mm -hmm. so be it. So in this particular instance, you took it in good faith. We did it in good faith. And you saw what, you, what was happening Absolutely. on the ground. Absolutely. How can you, as parliamentarians, guarantee no mischief from this or future administrations? That a future administration can actually use some inc incident somewhere and say, you know what, there is a threat to national security, the police are not capable to do this, the police need the support of the military, and then unleash the military on the people. Say so there is Mandamano for seven, for seven weeks, and it, police now, we Maliza tear gas, we tear gas, we back in barracks. It's a recourse for impeachment if you breach the constitution. It's extremely, extremely uh, dangerous ground. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter uh, what situation you are in you must stick to the constitution. You will find a rock president who will decide to unleash the military on its people unnecessarily. The benevolence of the Kenyan people is what was seen here, that there was support from the Kenyan people, the people who are factored in the north, and that is why this one succeeded. It's, it was spelled out, and if you see, if you look at, uh, if you read the Hansard and what came out from our debate in the House is that this should not happen again. Mm without involving parliament so we're saying that there was no window of opportunity whereby futurely such a case would not occur because some of the sentiment that came out at the time was if this can happen now then it doesn't preclude it from happening the in the future right yeah yeah the escape was that that they were saying no we we are not we have not been deployed okay we are simply supporting the police and the police is leading in the command mm. whether it is true or not if they had been deployed debate. what would we have seen that we're not seeing now then they will have had to come to parliament first of all to seek uh, parliament's approval before they could deploy but on the ground what how different would it be um it would be very different so right now they are answering to the county commissioner yeah. or the regional yeah, police commissioner, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. And if it was not even the, case, the budget is is from the Kenya police, we hardly spend much because we, this, this is not our budget. Is the police fueling the military machinery vehicles or not? That's their internal arrangement. But we, when we come and audit, then they will explain if they have spent from the Ministry of Defence. Okay. You, you know the questions are bound for one simple reason. Uh, Whenever you have an exceptional case such as the one we discussed, because of the exceptional circumstances, it opens a door. Absolutely. It's that door that one wants to guard against because you don't know what else can walk through that door once it has been opened. Yeah. Yes. Mm. That is what we wrote in our recommendation, that mm. we've, we've, we've allowed this, but mm. you must stick to the Constitution and the Kenya Defense uh, Act so that there is no abuse in future. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Much more. In the next hour, like we said earlier, we'll be hosting the outgoing UK. Uh, I knew High you were going there. Canada, uh, right? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, just, is it three weeks ago, Yeah, your committee spearheaded the approval by Parliament of a defence cooperation agreement yes. between Kenya and the UK that allows formally for their troops to be trained in this country. What else? What are the highlights of that defence cooperation agreement? Oh, the journey to getting the defense and cooperation mm. agreement is actually one of my highlights in my few months as being the chairman of uh, defense committee. 
let me tell you, there was serious reservation by Laikipia County. Petitions were sent. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a case, a uh, murder of Agnes Wanjiru, which yep. my committee is not finished with. <coughs> this lady, uh, Eric, was brutally murdered. Yep and uh, her body was thrown into a tank. septic tank. Mm. It was only discovered two, two months later. This lady had a five-month-old baby, and it's because it is believed that the officers that did this were officers who were training in Batuk, the officers from the UK Army. Mm. Unfortunately, we've not gone far, gone, gotten far, and uh, that was one of the impediments because this this defense cooperation agreement came from mm, the other parliament to this parliament. So there were those reservations. There was you know environment degradation by the military, the the Batuk uh, officers also, Loldaiga, there's Loldaiga Hills, mm -hmm. and many other petitions that we received. Yeah. Defense cooperation agreements is a tool that is being used now to institutionalize cooperation, defense cooperation agreements in nations. It is very important, uh, Eric. Mm. But sometimes also it has to be a win-win situation, a quid pro, uh, pro quo situation kind of. But at that point, we didn't feel that as a country, we the co defense cooperation agreement that lapsed had addressed our position uh, fairly. Number one, so when this defense cooperation agreement was brought, mischievously, they dropped uh, out uh, murder is an offense that can be chargeable in our territory. Who's they? The, the UK. The, the drafters. Yeah, because mm. it's, uh, it's the UK and Kenyan Defense Corporation yes. argument. Mm -hmm. So it came to us and we said, no, come mm -hmm. on. These people have just killed Agnes Wanjiro. You're bringing another defense corporation to say we sign and approve as a parliament, but you've not included murder. Mm -hmm. So it became a lot of diplomacy, trying to argue our case, and, and, and eventually we, we, we insisted that murder must be included in that defense corporation agreement before we signed. This thing had been passed in the UK, so mm -hmm. we've sent to the Ministry of Defense and say, you can only sign this agreement if. on condition that you, sign, you have murder as that a, offense that can be tried mm -hmm. within our side. How will you ensure that it's actually there? No, it loves us if they don't. It, it is a condition. Yeah, And you know, unfortunately, with the constitution that we are in, and uh, it's actually something to think on the standing orders, a, a def an agreement is sent to parliament and there are only two options. It's either you reject it, accept. reject it with recommendations, or accept it. So we reject it with recommendations. recommendations. It's something to look at. And in fact, defense cooperation agreement, any, any agreement that this country is going to sign to, uh, in future mm. should not have the term that it has now. Three, mm. Sometimes you find some of these agreements are three years or four years or five years. Yeah. We should have it as a year. Should agreement. be renewed annually. Yes, annually. Mm. So that if there are mis mischief and misgivings from <laughs> the other party, we, we are able to handle it. But nonetheless, let me tell you, we get a lot from this defense cooperation agreement between Kenya and the UK. Mm. Give the devil his due. Uh, Number we, one. They train our officers. There is, um, we have our naval officers. We do not have naval capacity, cap capabilities that the UK do have. Mm -hmm. Many of our officers go and train there. We have now about seven officers from Kenya Navy who are training in the UK. We have our pilots, many of them train in the UK. Um, we, have, uh, they, we have an exchange program um, that we, they give us uh, old um, equipment military hardware that did not use is sent to the country for the hand, for hand me down yeah, yeah. <laughs> from the UK for, to us. for us they are new so we take <laughs> them graciously <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. um, and of course you know there's uh, when they come here into the country they, they also improve on uh, our local economy in Nanyuki there's a lot of development there's a lot of money exchange mm. it's a good relationship mm. but it has to be on on a benefit, uh, beneficial uh, do, we, do we have any such agreement with any other country we do. We're actually going to have one with Seychelles. We have with so many countries, different mm. corporations, yeah. Okay. We're going to do one with Turkey. Mm. So many other countries uh, are going to come in. So with the signing of this agreement now as it is, are we going to see the officer who is suspected to have been involved in the murder of Agnes Wanjiro being repatriated? Or what does it mean? Absolutely. It is going to, in fact, it should have happened before. It is actually the Kenyan investigative agencies who have been very lax on finding out who the killers of uh, Agnes Wanjiru are. 
it is a problem with the with the DCI. In fact, uh, and shortly we will be summoning the director of criminal investigation to find out exactly what is happening with this case. This mm -hmm. never moved. Um, we want them to be tried also. Part of the things that we want is for them to be tried here. You see, for Agnes Wanjiri's family, you yeah. cannot afford a ticket to go mm -hmm. and, and see this trial being done in the UK. It's yeah. super expensive. So they were able to get away with that, with the last, con or with the last uh, cooperation agreement. With this one, they will be tried within our soil. So some of the benefits that we get from these cooperation agreements. Mm -hmm. And this, this can only happen, of course, if our investigators are able. Yeah, they have not done anything. And to come to Kenya and to prove its murder case with a high threshold of beyond reasonable doubt. Absolutely. Not even that. Let me tell you, it does, was... Does the agreement place any responsibility on the UK government to assist in investigations? Of Absolutely. Japan Absolutely. And share all information? Absolutely. It, it is. It is very clear. They need to uh, support us. In fact, if it is the officer, they need to hand over the officer to the Kenyan authorities for trial. Mm -hmm. That is exactly what it should be. Okay. Does this also take into consideration the environmental issues that come as a result of some of these officers training Absolutely. here in Kenya? Yes. We have had the issue of mines um, left, like unexploded, yeah. ordinance. unexploded ordinance yeah. left yeah. in the country. Yeah. We have young Kenyans who have been injured as yeah. a result of yeah. this. Yeah. Does this take that into it consideration? Does. Yeah. Future? Like I said, Loldaiga, there was a, a, a young boy also who was uh, hit by an, an explosive, um, a leftover explosive. And we've said that wherever they are training, it must. it is their responsibility if there is any degradation to the environment or their um, whatever uh, bombs or explosives that are left behind that is going to hit anyone uh, from this country. There has to be compensation from them. Someone has to be um, held, accountable. held account for that. Which my aunt asked this question, when we have these agreements, who is it on the Kenyan side, not the individuals, but who represent us in crafting, in negotiating these agreements? It's the Minister of Defense. It's uh, the Minister, the peers, and the entire structure of the Minister of Defense. So do we have expert negotiators in matters of defense? Absolutely. Absolutely. And do you have examples of negotiations that they've had that we can look at and say, they negotiated this well for the country and it was extremely beneficial for us. Unfortunately, I'm new here in this committee and I've just, this, this is the first one that's confronted okay. me, but homework. that's a homework here. <laughs> <laughs> I want to go back quickly as we conclude the conversation to the issue of the North. And you've said uh, several times, even the leaders from the North have said people trust the military more than they trust the police. Mm -hmm. Now, over the weekend, as the president was uh, attending this uh, prayer service yeah. in... Uh, what was it? In West Pokot. In West Pokot. Yeah. He hinted at the building of camps, military camps in the area. What would that entail? If you actually have military camps then now being set up in areas in West Pokot, in the Kerio Valley. You will appreciate, uh, Eric, that this, this is an area that has been largely controlled by mm -hmm. bandits. You have students who don't go to school. People have taken over. Uh, schools as their hiding places for mm. terrorism. To, to continue perpetu perpetuating this terrorism is just not fair to our stability. That's it true. is extremely risky to our stability. And I think, uh, considering that the military has so far given it a little, little, relative stability, mm -hmm. it is safe to continue having them. It's not a, it's, it's, it's a 60 year uh, activity that these people have been doing. The only way to do it now is, is to better is to build schools so that there's education. And after you've withdrawn, not, now, now they cannot uh, com uh, do any further banditry, mm. then the safest way to do is to teach them other practices that they can do of economic income, uh, economic uh, earning activities um, and, and also schooling. So it is not just about being there and restoring peace and living. That is what the mistake that we've continued to do. Right now, it will be like I said, you have to now uh, uh, drill uh, boreholes for them to have access to water. Mm -hmm. You must do roads and uh, uh, make sure that this continued 
uh, harmony between these two communities that live. Would that now have to be approved by uh, by Parliament? It doesn't have to because they already. I mean, if they now want to continue to stay there for long, of mm. course, it will seek approval because that means then that the military has, has been deployed. Uh, yeah, has been deployed. Okay, yeah. Mashua, thank you very much for joining us today. Oh, that was so short. It's short, right? <laughs> Come back. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's all. It's been a pleasure having you this morning, and we we hope to have you again soon. Thank you very much. The Honourable Nelson Koech is the MP for Belgut constituency and also the chairman of the Defence, Intelligence and Foreign Relations Committee, a crucial committee of the National Assembly. This is the Situation Room, the only way to start your day.